we with all due respect to all the leaders and all the institutions that are that have done a great job, you know, developing Islamic finance in the past thirty years. I think really, it, uh, and also because of the COVID, there's a greater uh, drive towards some kind of uh, reform or, or evolution of Islamic finance. Because Islamic finance, uh, in my opinion, uh, which is you know not a very informed opinion, uh, but at the same time I speak to Islamic finance leaders out there, and they sure. say this as well, sure. that Islamic finance has not managed to really fulfill the objectives uh, that they set out to, which is termed the makasid al Sharia or the objectives of yeah. Sharia. Yeah. Which uh, I mean, I, I won't go into detail, and I'm not an expert, uh, but one way I can portray this is that he has not managed to uplift uh, those who need help, basically. Right? He has not been inclusive enough. He has not been participatory enough. He has not been impactful enough. Yeah. So today, Islamic banking is there and in Malaysia, it's very well developed. Uh, and you know, Malaysia is the market leader. Uh, but still, it serves uh, mostly uh, larger businesses and of course, consumers. It does not serve... Mm. For example, microfinance is yes. it's not uh, very strong. Islamic finance is not yet strong there. Right? So, uh, um, and outside of banking and outside of the capital markets, you know, capital markets also typically it's big funds for big companies, the big projects, right? Not so much at the, at the community level. Yeah? Uh, so that's where I see Islamic finance has, has not reached its potential. Uh, secondly, Islamic finance has not uh, been able to integrate the commercial finance component with the social finance component mm. well enough. Because if zakat, as I mentioned earlier, zakat, wakaf, and yeah. sedekah is well integrated into so-called com- uh, mainstream or commercial finance, uh, then there'll be a lot of benefits, you know, really a lot of benefits. Today, we see the concept of endowment uh, being very big in the Western world, in the non-Muslim world. Yeah. Uh, all the big universities, the famous universities, had huge endowments with billions. And this concept of endowment came from, originally, the concept of wakaf. So this is uh, some really uh, deep intelligence or knowledge, which you know, is inspired yeah. from divine knowledge Correct. that we have with us, uh, mm-hmm. that other people are using, you know, non-Muslims are using to very good effect, and we are not doing it enough. Right? And then we talk about zakat. Zakat is a tax, uh, it's a kind of tax on uh, wealth and assets, you know. Whereas today we have inequality because most of the taxes is only on income, not on assets. Rich people don't earn or declare a lot of income. Yeah. What they have is a lot of assets. Yes. But typically the assets are not really properly taxed or there's ways mm. to go around it. Correct. And so we have this inequality building up over time yes, yes. and continuing to build up, right? So uh, I think, you know, if we, if we go back to the fundamentals of Islamic finance, and there are so many scholars out there who have written all sorts of books and papers on this, the key now is how do we bring all this theory mm. to be realized in the real world? Yeah. And to me, the avenue to do that is fintech. Right? Fintech has, will, can and does provide a platform for Islamic finance to be implemented in its true mm. form. Mm. or in its purer form, maybe, closer to its objectives. Uh, current Islamic finance, everything that is there, Islamic banking, capital markets, will still be there, it still has a role. I'm not saying, you know, we have to scrap that and try and do something new. You know, th- there's a lot of value there, but FinTech needs to come in to complement that and eventually to synergize with it. <laughs>